I like exploring the subject of creativity. And in particular, I like using creativity to solve problems. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I spent, uh, I've spent, I've been lucky actually to spend the um, last 30 years of my life in creative industries. Um, initially as an exhibit designer and then as a television director and lately as a creative director for an ad agency. Another ad guy, a famous one, George Lewis, said this. He said, creativity can solve almost any problem. The creative act, the defeat of habit by originality um, overcomes everything. And I love this quote. I absolutely love this quote. And in fact, I could almost just stop it right here because in a way, it, it kind of it captures everything that I believe about uh, the power of creativity to solve problems. But I am going to unpack it a little bit and, um, and share just five things that I've learned about using creativity to solve problems. The first thing is to define the constraints of the problem. And this is very important. It's something that's overlooked. It seems kind of mundane. But before you start engaging in solving a problem, you need to define the parameters of that problem. You need to figure out what you've got to solve the problem. What's uh, what's available? What uh, resources are available? What time is available? It's a little hard to see, but that's Apollo 13 up there. And 45 years ago, they faced a problem that was caused by an explosion, an unexpected explosion. They were on their way to the moon, and uh, on the way there, an explosion happened. And it created a lot of problems. The biggest one was that the CO2 level inside the capsule begin, began to increase and it was making the air that they were breathing uh, more and more poisonous. So they needed to figure that problem out. And in order to fill it, figure that problem out, they had, to, they had to really think inside the box. They had to define what they had inside that capsule that was available to help them solve the problem. And the guys uh, in NASA ground control were scrambling around trying to figure out, you know, what have they got up there? What, have, what can we put together? What can we create to help solve this problem? They needed... They needed to know, because it was no use thinking of something that was outside the capsule, outside the box. That wasn't going to help them at all. They had to think inside the box. So first thing that's really important to do is to, to find the constraints. I would say that trying to solve a problem without de defining the constraints is a little bit like playing squash in a court with no walls. It just doesn't work. The second thing that I've learned is that ideas don't just happen. They need to be provoked. You need to make them happen. You need to overcome the force of habit in order to make those ideas happen. So I want to talk about forces a little bit today. I'm a bit of a science nerd, so um, I don't mind talking about this stuff. And I'm going to talk about Newton's first law, my favorite. Um, Newton's first law is that a body at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by an external unbalanced force. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that this chair here, which has been sitting here since the beginning of my talk, will stay there sitting, doing nothing, until acted upon by an external unbalanced force. Simple enough. There are forces at play here. There's forces at play right now. There's the force of gravity down. There's the force of the, of the floor going up. And it's a balanced force. It's a body at rest. It's not going anywhere. You could say that it's, it's the habitual state of the chair. It's its habit state. And then an unbalanced force comes along and moves it. So I'm going to mash up uh, uh, Newton and George Lois here and come up with what I'm calling the first law of creativity. So a habit will remain a habit unless defeated by originality. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Unbalanced forces. An unbalanced force is an original idea. And this guy, Edward de Bono, gave those unbalanced forces a name. It's kind of a weird name. By the way, Edward de Bono is a brilliant guy. He's kind of the father of, of um, uh, lateral thinking. He's a, he's a kind of a creativity guru. He came up with a name for these unbalanced forces. It's kind of a weird name. Poe. And Poe, he, he talks about it being an extraction from words like hypothesis, <laughs> suppose, possible, and poetry. 
And these words give you a clue as to the nature of the word PO. It's also an acronym. And that's the one I like, provocation operation, because it suggests that there's an activity required, that creativity requires some action in order for it to happen. A PO is an idea, but more than that, a PO is a crazy, radical, nonsensical idea. That's the power of PO. So how does it work? Well, let's do a quick brainstorming session. We've all been in um, those rooms, meeting room with a whiteboard, and uh, today we're going to brainstorm ideas for a new restaurant. So on the board, we might have listed the things, the restaurants that currently exist in Regina. So there's lots of Italian places, there's lots of pizza places, um, there's lots of Greek places. So we're going to stay away from those. We want new ideas. So we start, and it's like, okay, people are throwing out ideas. So, so what, about, um, what about authentic Mexican? What about Russian? What about Nepalese? Oh, wait a minute. What about a family-friendly fondue place? What about a high-end burger place? What about a low-end sushi place? Mm, that doesn't sound so good. <laughs> and then someone shouts out from the back of the room, how about a restaurant that doesn't serve food? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> That's a po. A crazy idea that on the surface of it makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, so what do we do now? The third thing I've le learned is that you give absurd ideas respect. You don't toss them out immediately. In order for that po to be powerful, you need to let it breathe, you need to let it live, you need to consider the possibilities. Um, what would happen if that actually did exist? A Poe is kind of like a manufactured crisis. It didn't have to happen. Restaurant that doesn't serve food, that doesn't make any sense. Um, it's easy to dismiss it, but let's not, let's let it live. Um, it's just, and, and the way to treat it is, well, well that happened, it, it's a crisis. This restaurant doesn't serve food, what are we going to do? How are we going to make that work? How are we going to make that work? In Apollo 13, they didn't need another PO because the crisis was the PO. The crisis was the thing that set up the set of circumstances that um, provoked them to have to be creative. How are we going to do this? This thing happened and we need to do it. What are we going to do? How, how are we going to solve this problem? I know, I know. What about uh, we use the cover from the from the manual. We'll, we'll cut some hoses from, from the, the suits. We'll, we'll We'll use socks, we'll, we've got some gaffer tape, let's use that, let's, we've got some other stuff, let's put all this stuff together and make an air filter. No one would have thought of doing this in any other circumstance. The crisis, the Poe created the situation that allowed us to consider those things in a new way, and to consider the creative potential of bringing them together to solve a particular problem. And the thing is that they were up against time as well. They had a deadline, and they had a deadline that involved actual death. Deadlines are another great kind of Poe. My favorite deadline, bar none, is this one. December 31st, 1969, because that's the deadline that was implied when JFK said in his famous speech that they were going to put a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. He kind of liked that person at the back of the room that said, you know, hey, how about a restaurant without food? Except he said, hey, how about we put a man on the moon before the end of the decade? He didn't manufacture a fake problem or a fake crisis. He manufactured a real one. He put the U.S. reputation on the line. And he did it with optimism. And that's important. And that leads us to the fourth thing I've learned, is that you need to be optimistically objective. You need to look at how a problem might work, not how it might not work. You have to be hopeful and optimistic that that crazy idea, that thing that you're going to give consideration that's going to provoke new ideas, new thoughts, could actually work. So let's go back to our restaurant that doesn't serve food. How could that work? The PO is powerful if we, if we consider it. We give it legitimacy. We say, okay, let's, let's make it work. Let's figure it out. What would that look like? Restaurant that doesn't serve food. What does that look like? Okay, well, it doesn't serve food, so where, where would the food come from? If you're going there, you want to eat, but you're not going to get served. Well, you have to bring the food yourself. Well, wait a second. People go to parks, right? They bring food with them to a park. They have a picnic. It's kind of like an indoor picnic. That's kind of cool. That's kind of interesting. 
Um, so what would we do? Well, we'd provide a place for them to have their food. We, we'd provide nice tables and chairs and, and cutlery and, and maybe we could serve drinks. Maybe that's a way we could differentiate. We'd, you know, they bring the food, we provide the drinks, we give great variety and great selection. Maybe we could, um, maybe we could have a sharing table, you know? Like lots of people bring their own thing and we have a sharing table over here and, and so we could help out with that. We could heat up the food. We could provide all those services to make that work. Maybe we could provide some entertainment. Maybe the waiters could sing. Actually, wait, maybe people could sing. Maybe, maybe they could bring the food and the entertainment and we provide a little stage and we provide a little space for them to, uh, to get together and to connect and to share. And after a while, you start to see the potential of this crazy idea. It's like, well, okay, we would not have thought of any of those things if we hadn't let that crazy idea exist and actually treat it with some optimism and some hope that there might be a solution in there. And some of the things that we discover through that process could actually be useful when it comes to a restaurant that does serve food. And so in terms of a brainstorming exercise, in terms of being able to be open to those kinds of possibilities, it's really, really useful. This is a little mock-up of um, what the engineers at NASA built on the ground. And they built it quickly and tried to test it. Of course, they ran off at the beginning when the crisis happened and it's like, okay, what do these guys have up there? Let's figure out and now let's build this thing. Okay, they brought it all together and here's what they came up with. And they did it with optimism. Y y you know, they didn't think, well, uh, this is probably not going to work. No, they were hoping and praying. They were, they were believing it would work. This is going to work. I think it's going to work. We, we can use the cover from the manual. We can use socks. We can use a, this plastic thing, this hose. We'll cut it off the, the astronaut suit. It could work. There's no creative value in being cynical. There's no creative value in looking for the reason something won't work. It's far more productive, far more powerful to look at the reason something will work. I can tell you, as a creative person, I always think my crazy ideas are going to work. <laughs> I really do, all the time. And there's power in that. And I know a lot of other creative people in the audience that feel the same way. There's a force in that, and it's good to tap into that force. The last thing I've learned is to celebrate great ideas, regardless of who had them. Now, a lot of the work I do now is collaborative work. I rarely work alone. I really have to solve problems by myself. I work with a team. A lot of them are here today. And one of the things I believe about collaboration is that um, it really isn't great to collaborate with a bunch of people that are just like me. <laughs> you know, people that think the same way as me, that act the same way as me, that believe the same way as me. So it's really great, actually, to have a lot of a mixed bag a whole lot of different kinds of people in the room, bringing different kinds of perspectives. There's value in those different perspectives. There's a greater potential for the crazy idea or the different idea to come out in those discussions. For someone who has just a different kind of experience than me to say something that then we put on the board, it's like, okay, that was said, now we've got to deal with it. Now we've got to unpack that and try to make it work. And in that process, we want to treat other people's ideas with respect. This is something I learned from my wife, <laughs> actually. And uh, like many husbands, I didn't have a choice in the matter. Um, actually, I love my wife. And we are very similar. She's here in the audience, by the way. Um, uh, we're very similar in lots of ways. And, and that's one of the things that gives strength to our relationship. We share the same values. But we do think about things in different ways. We have different ideas sometimes. And sometimes she'll say things that I think are kind of nuts. And then, after a little bit, I'll realize, no, actually, that's kind of brilliant. And this happened, actually, a couple of years ago to us. We, were, we have two young children, and we were having a disagreement about a parenting issue, you know, how we, how we resolve something. And uh, during the course of the discussion, uh, Lori made this, what I consider to be a crazy suggestion. And I was like, well, no, but okay, how would that work? And we talked it through. And, and then finally I got to the point where it's like a light bulb went off and I was like, oh, yeah, you know what, you're right. Yeah, you're right. And then a funny thing happened. She got mad at me. <laughs> and she got mad at me because she thought that I was just agreeing with her to end the argument. And then I got mad at her because I was like, no, that's not what I was doing. It was a great idea. And, and I was trying to explain this to her and I found myself saying this. I said, look, it's not important for me to be right but it is important for us to be right. Because at the end of the day, what I care about, what, what, what really counted was what was right for my kids, not whether I was right. 
This is a picture of the final air filter that the Apollo 13 crew built and that saved their lives. I don't think anyone cared whose idea it was to use the cover of the flight plan or to use plastic bags or to use the socks. I don't think anyone cared. It was the idea that counted. That was what was important. It's the ideas that matter. Best idea wins, not who has it. So just to quickly conclude, the five things I've learned. Number one, define the constraints. Know the parameters you're working within, okay? Don't pretend that they're not there. They're helpful. They can actually help you, guide you toward a creative solution. Number two, provoke ideas. Don't wait for them to happen. Force them to happen. Push them. Make outlandish suggestions. And then three, give those absurd ideas respect. Give them the respect of being plausible, being possible. Say, okay, well, this happened. We're going to, you know, a restaurant with no food. We're going to let this happen. We're going to talk it through. We're going to see what, what ideas that uh, come out of that. And when you do that, be optimistic. Be optimistically objective. Look at the possibilities with a notion that it might work. Not, eh, it's probably not going to work, but we'll try it. Again, there's no creative value in being cynical. And lastly, celebrate great ideas, regardless of who had them. And if there's a secret sauce in creativity, especially collaborative creativity, that's it. That's it right there. Because we've got a lot of problems in the world. And they need our attention. We've talked about a few of them today. I'm going to leave you with one one big problem that actually I think that we should have a giant kind of brainstorming session, almost like a global brainstorming session. And actually it involves a spacecraft. It has humans on it. And, um, and the CO2 level is rising. And the level of CO2 is increasing so dramatically that we're running out of time. We need to solve the problem. Everything we need to solve the problem is right there. We just have to overcome our force of habit. We need to be creative and have new ideas. Best idea wins. Thank you.